I want to welcome everyone to the Institute for Health Policy Studies. Welcome everyone. We're very pleased that you've joined us today. I'm Claire Brindis. I'm the director of the Institute, and it gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce to you our visiting professor, um, Tom Rice. Uh, we've been very lucky that Tom was visiting us for the last couple of weeks and spending about six weeks with us. Tom, as you know, is a distinguished professor in the School of Public Health at UCLA, our sister institution. He is a professor of economics, health economics. He got his training at the University of California at Berkeley, graduating in 1982 in the Department of Economics, and has had a very distinguished career, not only in doing research in these areas, but also as an academic administrator. And he served as vice chancellor at UCLA of Academic Affairs, and also was the uh, acting director in the School of Public Health uh, while they were searching for their new dean. He's also uh, very happy to say that he's a member of the Institute's National Advisory Board. And his areas of interest have been, and not only interests, but passions and research, have been in the areas of medical uh, competition, Medicare, consumer choice. And today, um, he'll be speaking about some of these topics as it relates to, you know, are there too many choices? I also want to acknowledge that um, as an academic, uh, leader. He's also been very prolific, and many of you may know the book that is now in its third edition, The Economics of Health Reconsidered, which was published in 2009, and he has a new book that will be coming out uh, next year. So, Tom, we're very happy you're here. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much, Claire, and I uh, want to thank Claire and uh, Ed, who have been uh, my hosts for this uh, stay here. I've been here for a few weeks now, and it's really been a nice opportunity to be able to um, work with colleagues at, uh, at UCSF. Uh, today I'm going to be talking really about two topics. Uh, one topic is giving you some background on behavioral economics, which is much in the vogue these days. And the second topic is some of the research that we've done in this area, particularly in the area of whether people might have too much choice. We look mainly at whether there might be too much choice in the area of uh, health insurance. Uh, the work is funded mainly by an investigator award in health policy research from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, so I want to thank them. And I had a number of co-investigators who I wanted to acknowledge. Uh, three of these four people were at one point at UCLA. Um, Yaniv Hanek was my co-PI on the investigator award. He is now at the University of Plymouth in England. And then uh, Andrew Barnes and Janet Cummings were uh, PhD students at UCLA. Now they're professors, Andrew at uh, Virginia Commonwealth and Janet at Emory. And if there are any slides that are cleverer than text slides, those are Andrew's slides. Um, he, um, and Stacy Wood, Stacy is a professor of psychology at Scripps at uh, Claremont University. And she provided, among other things, the community lab that we did some of our experiments in. So to start with, about the first half of the talk is about behavioral economics. And I think the best way to start is to tell you what behavioral economics isn't, because that gives you a better idea, perhaps, of what it is. What behavioral e economics isn't is how economic incentives influence behavior. It might seem like that's behavioral economics, but that's actually regular economics. That's what we like to, in, in economics, we've traditionally been interested in how economic incentives affect behavior. Uh, I'll give a couple examples here. If we um, charge more for services, do people use fewer services? Well, that's one thing we learned from the Rand Health Insurance Experiment. We also learned, surprisingly, that they don't use less of the stuff that isn't very useful. They kind of use less of everything. That's been a very important finding in the research uh, field. Another example, if we pay physicians a salary, uh, are they going to provide fewer, unne uh, fewer unnecessary services than under fee for service? These are the sorts of issues that we study in economics. So behavioral economics has to be something that's different than that. And to what it is to me, and I think to most, is its deviations from certain classical economic assumptions. And in the book that Claire mentioned, I've listed lots and lots of those assumptions, but I'll just mention three of them here, and then I'll go over each of them. So the first of the assumptions that behavioral economics, in a sense, is going against, but 
uh, tenets of regular economics. First of all, that people are hyper-rational. They make the right decisions. Uh, print, you, can, you can count on people to make the right decisions is an assumption of economics, and that's why we rely on markets, because who knows better than these people to make the decisions. So that's an assumption of regular economics, that behavioral economics um, often uh, disagrees with. A second is that people have no trouble going through the massive amount of information there. The information is helpful, it doesn't get in their way. And a third assumption is that people come to the world knowing what they want. They have what I call a firm set of immutable preferences. Now, um, in their book that some of you know, Nudge, uh, Thaler and Sunstein distinguish between two types of people. One type of person they call econs, and that's actually short for a term that's been around for maybe centuries, homo economicus, people, rational economic man. And what they do is they contrast uh, the econs to another group of people, and he calls them humans. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that uh, those who believe in behavioral economics don't think that these assumptions are the way in which people, uh, people really behave. So here's a little quote from uh, their book. If you look at an economics textbook, you'll learn that Homo economicus can think like Albert Einstein, store as much memory as <coughs> IBM's Big Blue, and exercise the willpower of Mahatma Gandhi. And that kind of is the, the essence behind the assumptions of classical economics. So what I'm going to be doing is going through these three assumptions of classical economics a little bit more. So basically, what you need to decide, I guess, for yourself, and particularly in the area of healthcare, is what, how do you think people think? Are they like Mr. Spock, or are they like Homer Simpson? <laughs> <laughs> that was an Andrew's slide. <laughs> so let me go through each of these. Uh, Hyper-rationality. Um, so the key assumption in microeconomics is something called revealed preferences. You economists know all about it. Basically what it says is if you choose something, it was the best choice for you, or you would have chosen something else. Uh, it's the essence of welfare theory. It's also been criticized as being perhaps circular. Um, there have been uh, many economic espousers of this, but actually the first person espousing it probably was not a trained economist. In fact, he probably wasn't even real. Uh, it was Mr. Pangloss, who you might remember from Candide. So I want to read you a, a quote from, uh, a quote from, um, from Dr. Pangloss. And this, this, to me, is what revealed preferences is. Uh, it's demonstrated that things cannot be otherwise, for since everything was made for a purpose, everything is necessarily for the best purpose. Note that noses were made to wear spectacles. We therefore have spectacles. <laughs> Legs were clearly devised to wear breeches, and we have breeches. And since pigs were made to be eaten, we have pork all year round. Therefore, those who have maintained that all is well have been talking nonsense. They should have maintained that all is for the best. Now, you might say, well, that's Pangloss. He's fictional. Smart economists would never think this way. Well, if you thought that, you would be wrong. So here's a quote I have from a Nobel Prize winner, Gary Becker, who most of you have heard of, and his colleague, Kevin Murphy. And um, this is in the context of illicit drugs. Addictions, even strong ones, are usually rational in the sense of involving forward-looking maximization with stable preferences. Uh, probably not the way you think of it at the Institute, but uh, the way that classical economic theory might think of it. So the second assumption I wanted to mention is whether people can handle all the information. And uh, this issue has been around for at least 60 years. It was first uh, thought of by, uh, by uh, Herbert Simon. And uh, he called it bounded rationality. And the idea of bounded rationality is that people are able to sift through all of the information, spend the time to do it, and make the decision that's right for them. And Simon disagreed with this. He thought that uh, there were impediments. He called them, uh, well, there, there were cognitive impediments. You just can't go through all that information. So he thought rather than people making decisions the way the economists said they made them, that they used what he called heuristics or shortcuts or rules of thumbs. They might do something called satisficing rather than maximizing. Other research, by the way, has found that people who are satisficers rather than maximizers tend to be happier people. 
that uh, it's just um, re been reading, still reading the book about Steve Jobs, and there was an example of someone who is a maximizer, and it's good that we do have some maximizers uh, out, out there, I think. Um, there is um, a lot of evidence to the contrary um, about this. Um, less than 10% of Medicare beneficiaries are choosing the lowest cost drug plan. I'll get back to that later. Um, one study I like by another former student, Lauren McCormick, this was uh, some time ago, uh, looked at, uh, did an experiment of Medicare beneficiaries. They gave one set of beneficiaries uh, the Medicare Plus U handbook that everyone gets every year. The other group, they gave that same handbook, but they also gave detailed information about the Medicare health plan quality. And they looked at what the people did. It turns out the people who got the more information used less information and they were less likely to switch plan. There is an information overload and people do have other priorities that they're spending their mental resources on. So there are issues about whether people can handle the, uh, handle the information. So um, this is what seniors face. Um, in, the, in the market. So this is a um, graph that my wife, Kate Desmond, and I put together. And um, I'm not going to go over it, but this shows what a Medicare beneficiary has to go through in order to decide on whether to pick a Medicare Advantage plan or traditional fee-for-service, <coughs> picking a drug plan and picking a Medigap plan. And, th and this really is much more, much simpler than the reality. And there are two reasons this is much simpler than the reality. One is that I put chooses extended drug coverage and chooses basic drug coverage under Part D. That's not how it works. There's actually a continuum of drug coverages because companies are allowed to offer actuarial equivalents. It's not standardized. I'll talk about standardization at the very end. And uh, as a result, people really can't make, it's very hard to compare one drug plan to the other. So the, and the second way I've simplified is that I've listed plan A, B, and C, but as you'll see later, there are a lot more health plans than that. So, you know, on the one, you can look at this and say, well, that's crazy, but what really is crazy in my mind is if you think about the situation that you're in. We're both, in, we're probably almost all of us are in the UC health plans. We have like five choices. That's all we have to do in health insurance. So it's interesting that what we've done, and we put so much more, um, information rich environment to seniors who on average have declining cognitive uh, cognitive abilities on average have less uh, have less education and on average are less computer savvy and these things are done on the computer so it's really interesting how we've set things up the people who could most handle the information don't have to handle nearly so much. The people least able to do it have to be given, or are, are being given a scary amount of information and then basically blamed if they make, uh, if they make the wrong choice. So the, uh, the third of the assumptions is immutable preferences. Basically, in the way I put it, is people benefit from all the good information of advertising, but they're uh, never hoodwinked by it. And, um, but I think that like the hallmark of a successful advertising campaign would be actually to change people's behavior, to change their tastes. Um, so here's, um, here's an example uh, of this from a while back. This is 19, 2000 data. And it shows advertising money for three products, Viox, Pepsi, and Nike. It's interesting, Nike and Pepsi that spent less than Viox uh, were a series of products. Viox was just Viox. And uh, you might remember what happened, uh, what happened with Viax. There was a, over 100,000 people got severe heart failure. Uh, Merck ended up paying a $5 billion fine. And uh, some people were really messed up by this. And uh, it's not, you know, pe people did not have this immutable taste for Viax over the other NSAIDs. You know, what they, um, they were convinced that this is, the, uh, this is the product they needed and it caused a lot of harms. Now, har a lot of harm. Now, uh, some economists still are not buying. I can't convince everyone. So here I've got two for the price of one. I've got a quote from two Nobel Prize winners, uh, two really famous ones too, uh, George Stigler and Gary Becker. Taste neither change capriciously nor differ between people. One does not argue over taste for the same reason one does not argue over the Rocky Mountains. Both are there, will be there next year too, and are the same for all men. <laughs> I think they meant it. Um, 
<laughs> anyway, so uh, let me move on to just some selected, um, selective, uh, selected insights from behavioral economics to make it more tangible to you before moving on to some of our research. And uh, I, I list five of them here. So the first is a, the endowment effect, which is similar to status quo by it. The idea if a person comes in possession of something, they feel ownership for it, and they overvalue it. And therefore, they might not be making the best choices for themselves. So a, a classic experiment is done with something like coffee mugs and chocolate bars. So what you do is you can find out in the population how many people would prefer a $5 coffee mug, how many would prefer a $5 chocolate bar. But then you do an experiment where you have people do a task. And then you ask them, and then you give them at the end a chocolate bar or a, or a coffee mug. It turns out that whatever you give them, they're attached to. They uh, they give more value to it, and they're much less likely to trade for the other object, even if they would have liked the other object more. So that's sort of the idea. Um, in the real world, um, five to ten percent of switch. Actually, only five percent of seniors voluntarily switch their Medicare Part D drug plans each year even though 95% could save money if they did switch. They're, they're attached to it. It's a, you know, it's a bit of a pain to switch. It's an, an, an example of status quo bias. Um, so I think the implication that behavioral economics would have here is we need to make it easier to understand the advantages of considering alternatives. People are just not going to go through all the information out there and know they should switch. We need to make it easy for us. So that would what be what behavioral economics would tell us. A second tenet of, um, well, tenet's probably the wrong word, uh, implication of behavioral economics is loss aversion. Uh, people have a, a heightened tendency to avoid losses. In other words, Losing something is worse than gaining something is good. And um, empirically, it appears that losses, people weigh about twice as much as gains. Uh, I can give you a simple example from insurance. So 83% of homeowners paid $100 extra to have in premiums to have a $500 deductible rather than a $1,000 deductible but only 5% of a claim each year. So the actuarial value of that is there's a f difference in $500 between 1,000 and 500. 5% of that is $25. So what that uh, tells you is that people are spending $100 to spend and save an expected value of $25. It is conceivable that someone would have a risk aversion function that was shaped that way, but it's unlikely that they would. Uh, people uh, have an aversion to, uh, to losses. And this is exact same thing happens in Medicare Part D, that people are paying too much in premiums uh, to, uh, to, avo to avoid deductibles. So a framing, so how could we use this in behavioral economics? One thing you can do is frame negatively the glass half empty. You can frame to say that if you don't change drug plans, you may be leaving on the table or losing $400. So that might be one implication of, uh, of behavioral economics. A third one, uh, overly discounting the future. People rely too much on what, you know, what they can see, what's salient, what's soon. Like you know, the temptation to eat fatty food, at, but not worry so much about the risk of obesity. Uh, even though over time as you do it, um, the health risks get greater and greater and greater. And so what you can try to do is come up with ways to make the future more salient or to trick people more into worrying about the future. I want to just tell you really briefly about a uh, Benartzi's at UCLA, a program called Save for uh, Tomorrow by Benartzi and Thaler. So this is in the area of retire in retirement savings. So as you know, people in the United States save very little money. And how do we get them to do it? Well, they've come up with a program, and it's actually in place now in most of the Fortune 500 companies, where people make a deal with themselves. What they do is they say, if they're going to get a raise over, say, 3%, that any of the raise over 3% is automatically channeled into their 401k even without asking. Now, they agree to this in the beginning when they, get their, when they become employed, but they don't ask them year after year. And this, the beauty of this is that they're saving extra for the future, and they don't suffer from loss aversion because you're like letting them keep the first 3% of the raise. And it's apparently been very effective in getting people to, uh, 
to increase their uh, savings. And that's considered a behavioral economics type of tool. Huh? It's similar to the sort of automatic default that a lot of 401k um, sponsors, where they sign up employees for an automatic 3% of their salary mm -hmm. on that first day and then don't ask them again. Yeah. And so, but does the employee get to choose on the first day? <coughs> they do. Yeah. But then they don't ask them again. Yeah. And, and I read just the other day that there's now defaults on li the life cycle options uh, for 401ks. The idea being people make some really bad uh, decisions on how to invest their 401ks. So they make the default a life cycle option, which is where the riskiness of your portfolio declines as you get older and you have more immediate need for the money. And so that would be a another example of that. Uh, this doesn't, th decision fatigue. Um, so choices should be consistent over time. If you make a choice today in the same situation, you make the same choice tomorrow. But it doesn't work that way. The brain gets lazy after us to make decision after decision. There have been lots of very cool experiments about, about this. Um, I say that uh, often gets more conservative or risk averse. Uh, so one lesson here is you shouldn't grade all your papers at once. Because if you try to do all 30 of them, the first one you're in a certain state of mind. By the end, you've suffered from decision fatigue. So that's really not a good idea to, uh, to, to do that. There was a startling study that came out a couple years ago. Some of you may have seen by a Dan Ziger and colleagues. This is not a health study. It's a parole study. They looked at uh, the behavior of parole judges in, in Israel and asked whether justice is what the judge ate for breakfast. And uh, brace yourself. So they had over 1,000 uh, parole decisions. And this is several judges. At the beginning of the day, parole was granted about, seven, about three quarters of the time. That went down over time until mid-morning where it, the parole, did, par parole was granted 0% of the time. Then the judge got a snack, went up to over 70%, declines again to lunchtime to 10%, judge each lunch, over 70%. You can see what happens. And this would be an example of uh, decision f fatigue. I've seen you know, the point counterpoints about this article. Yeah. People criticize that people have uh, They've defended themselves. I actually think they have pretty good answers to uh, to the criticisms that have been made to the uh, to the article. But anyway, it's about the most dramatic example one can imagine of a situation like this since um, since lives. There's, there's also a study uh -huh. um, here a couple of years ago with immigration judges, uh -huh. and it's it's not what they eat for breakfast, but it's over time when they're overwhelmed with immigration mm -hmm. cases. Yeah. Initially, you know they're pretty fair, and then over time, yeah. you know, as they, as they do it, I, you know, they just get overwhelmed and the fairness quotient that they try. Yeah. When, when people have too much work to do, that's uh, not, not, not surprising. And per, that's a perfect example of decision fatigue. So what our study uh, looks at is whether people have too much choice. And I'm going to mention two studies from the literature, both from Sheena Iyengar, and then talk about our research. So the first one, some of you probably have heard about the JAM experiments. This is actually the article. The f next three slides is actually about three things, not just JAM. But this was the um, most colorful one. So uh, how many of you have been to Drager's in Menlo Park? A few of you. So Drager's is a fancy grocery store in Menlo Park. But at one point, it was a really fancy grocery store because there weren't other stores like it around. So they have um, endless varieties of uh, competing mustards, you know, that sort of store. And uh, so what, uh, when Sheena Iyengar, who's one of the stars in this field, was a um, graduate student at Stanford, she had set up an experiment where they set up a tasting stand at Drager's one day versus another day. One day they put six jars of jam uh, on the counter. It's always the same brand. And then another day they put 24 jars of jam on the counter. And what they found was that when they're more, oh, and then you could, ta you, you could taste the jams for free and then you can get a $1 coupon to purchase it. And what they found is that if there are more jams on the table, more people stop by to taste. They taste about the same number of jams. But if you put 24 jams on the table, almost no one purchased jam. Only 3% purchased a jar of jam, whereas if you put six jars on the table, only 30%, 10 times as many purchased jam. And you can sort of see why. With 24 jams there, how would you know that you picked the right one? That's probably what was going, what was going on there. 
They also have, in the same paper, they talk about their chocolate experiment. And I want, there's a lot to the chocolate experiment. These the next two are college students that were, were looked at. But the simplest, the, I think the most interesting result from this is they looked at a situation where there's six chocolates or 30 chocolates, okay? And either you chose or you were assigned a chocolate. And um, they had people do a task, okay? And then they said, how would you like to be rewarded? It turns out the people who uh, got to choose among six, six chocolates, 48% of them wanted to be awarded for their work in chocolate. When there, people chose among 30 chocolates, only 12% wanted to be awarded in chocolates because, uh, you know, they wouldn't know whether they're choosing the right chocolate. Interestingly, though, fewer 10% wanted to be awarded in chocolate rather than cash if they were assigned a chocolate. So some choice is better than, uh, better than no choice. The last thing they looked at was extra credit essays, and they gave students a choice of 30 or th six or 30 different topics. And you'd think with so many topics you'd do better if you had a, a wider choice, but actually it wasn't the case that more students were, chose to do an essay if, um, if there were fewer topics and objectively graded they, they did better essays. So anyway, that's uh, some, uh, one of the more colorful articles uh, in, in the literature. Oh, and then their second study was about things more important than chocolate. It was about 401ks, and they used real data. They looked at almost a million people who, who used the Vanguard Fund and lots of industries and plans. And employers have a choice about how many, uh, how many um, portfolio distributions you can choose from in 401ks. And the employers varied between two sets of choices and 69 sets of choices. What they found is the employers that gave more choices of portfolio uh, people are less likely to put money in 401ks. And what they found is for every t increase in 10, uh, 10 fund, an increase in 10 fund choices, as it went up by 10 more funds, uh, participation rates fell by one and a half to, uh, to 2%. So yet another example. So if you're interested in this stuff, you should read this book. <laughs> uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by, uh, Dan by Daniel Kahneman. He was another Nobel Prize winner although he, in economics, although he's a psychologist. And uh, he did the most important work in this area originally with his colleague Amos Tversky, who's no longer with us. And Kahneman in this book has really put together his thoughts about the whole field. It's a long book, but I recommend, uh, I recommend it, uh, it highly. Anybody read the book here? Yeah, a few. So let me tell you about our, our research about uh, Part D of Medicare. So Part D has been a pretty successful program. Enrollment rates are high. Satisfaction is high. Uh, premiums are lower than anticipated. This is not like utterly shocking. Part D, uh, pr the, uh, medic the premiums that people pay are subsidized at the 75% level. So for seniors, this is a good deal. You can contrast this with the, some of you know about catastrophic back in 1988. That wasn't subsidized at all and it got repealed. So I mean, it's not surprising this is a popular program, but it has been successful and seniors like it. But seniors might not be making the best choices. As I mentioned, only about 5 to 10 percent of people are changing, switching plans each year. The most recent study found that only 5.2 percent of seniors are choosing the cheapest plan available to them. And it's not really clear if there are any other characteristics you would be interested in besides how much money you pay. We can talk about that at the, how much you pay. You can talk about that at the end if there are any other important characteristics. And on average, they're, put, they're leaving about $370 on the table. An, an other set of economists, Gruber and Ablick, found that consumer welfare would be maximized with only uh, three plans. So how many plans are there? Well, this is how many there were in 2008. Um, and this is just Part D plans. It doesn't include Medicare Advantage plans. It doesn't include Medigap plans. So somewhere like where you live or where I live, people, will, Medicare beneficiaries would have over 100 choices of plans. Now, the Obama administration came in, saw this, didn't like it, and so they actually wrote a Federal Register rule to make it a little bit harder for, for companies to sell multiple plans and, uh, and cited, cited the literature, including some of the work that we had done, and now it looks like this. So it's gone down by about 40%. So there's still a whole lot of choices, but it's now the low 30s rather than the um, mid 50s. So we had, um, did some experiments. I mentioned three experiments here. The first was with pen and paper. 
and the second and third use computer software. Then I'll tell you briefly about a pol policy proposal, then some current work. So our first experiment, the pen and paper, um, most of these were done in Claremont, California, where Stacy Wood had her community lab. And so the Claremont's about 30 miles east of Los Angeles. And we had a sample of 192 people. It was uh, not a random sample of the population, but we had equal numbers of younger people and older people. And we eat both the younger people and the older people, we randomized to three 10 or 20 drug plans. They would choose among those. You'll see what that means in a, in a second. And we gave them data that looked just like the Medicare website and then we collected some other information, including some psychological variables. So this is an example of the information that people saw if they were randomly assigned 10 drug plans. Some people saw only three rows, some people saw 20 rows, depending on which uh, arm of the experiment were they in. And this is what Medicare tells you, the total combined annual cost, that's always gonna be what we're most interested in. That's how much you'd spend on premiums plus out-of-pocket costs, whether you can get the drugs mail order, et cetera. You can, see, you can see those things. So this is the information that they're given and what we gave them in the experiment. So we would do, th we didn't want to ask them about their own experience and some of them own Medicare drug plans, so we asked them about their friend Bill. And uh, another experiment we did, we asked about their friend Claire. So there you go. Um, <laughs> And uh, so we would ask questions like, given Bill's desire to minimize total annual costs of drugs, which plan which do you think he should choose? And then thinking about how confident, thinking about your answer, how confident are you that you made a good decision? So first thing we found is that seniors did what, that we had four factual questions. Seniors did worse than younger people, and those seniors are the one who actually have to do this. Um, and they did worse in identifying the lowest cost plan but they were more likely to say than younger people that they are very confident they had chosen the best plan. Mm -hmm. So hold on to that for a second. We send the same thing I thought is even odder with number of plans. If people had more plans to choose from, they're less likely to get the right answers. But those assigned 20 plan were more confident that they had chosen the correct plan compared to those who were assigned three. The only thing I can come up with there is maybe the people who chose three plans thought it was a trick or something. I don't know. But, uh, what this tells me is that people are really overestimate their ability to deal with the choices that they face. So that was kind of what we got out of that. Now, in another article, we added some other variables. And we added uh, the two I'm going to talk about. You know, we controlled for lots of things. But uh, the two psychological-ish variables I want to talk about are speed of processing and numeracy. Speed of processing is how fast the brain works. And the test was really simple. You have two columns of numbers. Uh, and um, so lots of rows. And what the person does is each each number is lots and lots of digits. And the person simply compares whether the digits in the, first in the first column are the same as the digits in the second column. Are these two numbers next to each other, identical numbers or not? Then you go to the next one. It's tedious, but you only do it for three minutes. You see how many they get right in three minutes. Numeracy, turns out speed of processing didn't matter in anything we did. But numeracy mattered in everything we did. So we asked actually 11 questions about numerical abilities. And I think this is taken from Ellen Peters' uh, surveys. But I'm going to just give you three of the 11 questions so you get a feel for what numeracy is. <coughs> Imagine that we roll a fair, -sided, a fair six sided die a thousand times. Out of a thousand rolls, how many times would the die come up even? Okay. In the big bucks lottery, the chances of winning a $10 prize are 1%. Out of a thousand people, uh, it, what's your best guess how many people would win $10 if a thousand bought a ticket? And probably the hardest one here in the Acme publishing sweep takes the chance of winning a car one in a thousand. What percentage of tickets um, win, win a car? So that's, um, that's what numeracy is. And uh, it turns out that numeracy not only mattered, it took away the oomph from our age variable. So either the fact that older people were less numerate meant that they did worse, or numeracy is proxying for something else. And I can't tell you what it is. But consistently in our work and other work, numeracy seems to really matter in people being able to comprehend all this information. Then we did our mouse lab experiment. And uh, mouse lab is very cool software. Um, so 
what we're trying to understand is how people make decisions now, not necessarily just what they decide on. So what Mouse Lab does, it's software where the, the, it follows where the mouse goes, where the cursor goes. So which cells in a grid does it go to? How long does it linger there? Does it return to those cells? What's the pattern that's used? And uh, we're able to uh, track that with the software. So we did the same experiment as on a different group of people. Uh, in the Claremont area, but we put them on a computer. And we're interested in a few things. First of all, do older and younger people search information differently? Secondly, uh, if there's more information out there, more plans, do people search differently? And then, how does age, number of plans, and the search strategy affect performance? So these are process. And then we want to see how age, number of plans, and how they searched affect uh, performance. So what people are done is given is they're given a slide like this one that you saw earlier and then we ask them some questions about it. Now the one thing about Mouse Lab that you might not like but it's the way the software work and some of our current work we're not doing it this way is that it's like uh, Jeopardy which is you can't see the number underneath until you put the cursor over it. Now we let people take notes, there's no time limit, so what they do is they, they put the cursor over the information and they reveals it, then it turns back. So it takes a while to get it right. This is what it looks like if there are three screenshots. This is what it looks like if there are nine. We couldn't do more than nine, it just wouldn't fit on a, uh, wouldn't fit on a page, on a computer page. And um, our results, so older people were less likely to identify the cheapest plan. They had lar larger dollar losses by choosing inferior plan. And the reason was they were using inferior search processes. They were focusing on the attributes rather than the alternatives. So what does that mean? What that means is that the older people, we were asking, what's the, what's the cheapest plan? And so what you should be doing is looking at this column and looking at the alternatives. But what older people are likely to do is look at the attributes, look at irrelevant information. So that was the main reason that they, um, that they did uh, more, more poorly. But don't some of those attributes translate into savings that, get fa that might be factored in, yeah. such as having something mail ordered versus yeah. going to pick up? Because you can you spend can. a long time in that Kaiser line at the Geary you Clinic. Can in taxi and all that other stuff that mail order is yeah. incredibly convenient and cheap. We can't really we, we're able to adjust for almost everything except what you just asked. <laughs> uh, so this column this column takes into account deductibles and cost sharing but it doesn't take into account like travel and time for uh, travel time. So you're right if a company didn't didn't offer mail order uh, that would be something that might be logical. So yeah, I think that that's, I think that that's a good point. I, I, agree, I agree with that. And there are also things like how you get along with your doctor and whether, I mean, for older people, that's really important. Yeah, but that's not what we, but that's not what we ask them. What we ask them is, uh, in, what we ask them what the cheap, what, if, if Bill wanted to save money, what was the cheapest plan? So, so we were, it, was, it was a quiz question rather than taking all these other factors. What we wanted to see is if they were able to get rid of the extraneous information. Uh -huh, Wendy? But it seems like it's set up so that it's hard to get rid of the extraneous information. I mean, actually, just last night I was picking a travel insurance plan. Mm -hmm. And it looked, you know, you pick the ones you want, you get a grid that looks exactly like that. But you can delete the ones you don't want so that you're left with, you know, then you sort of compare them on different things. And yeah, welcome to Medicare. I mean, this is what you see when you get on the Medicare website. And so we want to make it realistic. I've read that there are ways on the Medicare re website that you can then winnow down to fewer, less information. I have not succeeded in doing that, but I've read that you can do that. There is the drug plan calculator that then spits out some results and you can narrow that down. Then you can narrow that down, yeah. And I don't think the website is bad. It's just there's so much information on it, it's hard for people to process it all. Uh, so the last thing I want to mention is that more... More ch people also did worse with, uh, with, more ch with more choice, but if they use the right 
decision algorithm. They looked at alternatives rather than attributes. More choice didn't get in the way. And that's, again, I'm going to mention at the very, very end, which is going to be very, very soon when I talk about standardization. We did another study. I, I'm running out of time. So, so we called it one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. And what we did is we, uh, we tried to simplify information by doing three things. Uh, using dollar signs rather than actual dollar amounts, sort of like quality ratings or numbers of stars, real versus ficti fictitious versus real company names and three versus nine plans. And uh, just to save time, I'll say that uh, when we simplify in information, people are able to, to do better. Uh, and particularly three versus nine plans, but also they actually did better with dollar with like two versus three dollar signs versus actual uh, numbers. But I won't go over, I won't go over that study. I wanted to I think I just have two more slides left. I wanted to mention a policy proposal that we came up with. Um, so the idea of nudging is to not take away choice, but to guide people. This goes a little bit farther. This proposal, which I did with uh, Janet Cummings, who I mentioned earlier, um, was a proposal that maybe what we should do is have govern, go, uh, government winnow down the number of drug choices first to the best and the brightest, and then have people choose from a smaller, smaller array of plans. Let, let government do the first cut. And um, what we did in this study is we looked at three examples where government actually did winnow. One example was from retirement savings, where state government winnows down the number of 4-1 choices for state employees in their so-called 457 plans. Another was from the Arizona Medicaid program called Access. Another was from the um, uh, demonstration on durable medical equipment. And we found in all of these cases, government was able to successfully winnow down the number of choices. So we wrote an extremely long paper about that, <laughs> which you can read if you want. Um, and finally, some current work. Um, one thing we're looking at, I'm looking at with some colleagues at the Kaiser Family Foundation, is how people are doing in terms of uh, their choice quality, although we're not allowed to call it that. In the three private markets, they deal with Medigap, Part D, and Medicare Advantage. We know from the literature people are doing poorly in Part D. We're still analyzing the Medicare Advantage data. The Medigap data was really interesting. Medigap, as many of you know, is standardized, which means uh, Plan F is Plan F. It has an identical set of benefits no matter what company sells it. So the main thing is the premium, although you might also be interested in service or the company company you might be loyal to. And what we found is that where we could, stage we could look at this, is that people were choosing the che generally the cheapest plan for Medigap. But we don't know if it was because it was standardized or not. And that's because the cheapest plan was normally the AARP plan which is the most common plan that people buy. However, there was one of our five states where the AARP plan was not the cheapest. It was very expensive, and its market share was much lower. That told us something about standardization maybe being a very good thing. And one thing that would be really interesting to look at as time goes on is uh, the uh, exchange in California versus other states. Because California's exchange is almost completely standardized. Once you choose a metal color, uh, platinum, gold, silver, bronze, every company has to sell the same thing. That won't be true in the federal exchange in other states. So it'd be interesting to see whether Californians at least by, by, uh, make better choices because it's easier for them. And I think that they probably will. We're also doing some work that's even less far along about choices in the exchange. We, a Andrew Barnes has a sample of a now we have 200 uninsured rural Virginians, and we're putting them in front of a computer and seeing how they're doing. And then we have an internet sa savvy sample from something called Amazon Mechanical Turk. And these are people who uh, spend their day on the computer raking in money. So we gave people a quarter to answer whether they're uninsured. And if they answered yes, then we gave them a couple bucks to do a vast array of psychological and other tests uh, for us. And one of the things we're interested in is whether the internet savvy people do better than the rural people uh, uh, when they're uninsured. These are all uninsured people on the exchange. So that's some of the current the current work that we're interested in. So um, but anyway, thank you very much. Great talk. Thank you very much. And um, so if we accept the assumption that maybe there is too much choice, which I agree, you've convinced me of that. But what um, you said that there were some experiments in which government 
government, in quotes, tries to winnow down the number of choices, but what, what really should, what other process could we imagine that could be used to winnow down the number of choices, rather, that, that would be sort yeah. of a non paternalistic process of doing that that might be acceptable you want to, answer that to one? people? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> or have there been any efforts to figure that out? Government winnowing uh, choices is the people accuse government of you know, interfering in their lives more. So uh, what would you think of an alternative of um, you arrive at the Medicare website and you're actually asked some brief questions and then based on those questions you get back a winnowed set of choices that says given your priorities we think these are the, the plans most um, um, mm -hmm. uh, that fit best for, for your priorities but you still have all the other ones if you want to click here. And that's exactly the way it's done in the private sector. So there are about five sets of private exchanges out there now nationally. For example, e, e, the one you've heard of is ehealthinsurance.com. And that's exactly what they do. They give you certain questions, you answer them, and they take those answers to try to guide you. I think, and like what, so you talked about non paternalistic. I, let me start with the opposite direction, which is the most paternalistic thing you could do, which is you could tell people what would be their best choice next year under the proviso that you use the same drug next year as this year. This has been done in, in, in one study and it's influential. When you tell people move to the plan number 31, whatever it is, a lot of them do move to it. So that would be one thing that you could do. But the idea of having government favor one company over another is highly problematic, uh, and so um, politically it would be uh, extremely difficult to do. So yeah, I think you'd have to do something like Adam said, which is ask innocent questions and still winnow it down to manageable, uh, manageable sense. That anything smacked of the government guiding people towards a particular company would uh, be problem would be problematic. I think. Mm -hmm. Well, how are you going to reach the people who aren't going to go to the computer? and do all this stuff. I mean, the average older person is going to go, I'm not going to go to a computer and do anything. But maybe someone else can answer that question, too, because the exchange is an online exchange. So there are going to be facilitators. Now, the facilitator, though, is not going to be able to choose for you. So I'm not exactly sure how that interaction is going to happen between the facilitator and you when it gets down to choosing on the computer. Yes? So what we see in uh, more along the lines of enrolling people in Medicaid or Medi-Cal here in California has been the emergence of what's called a certified application assistant. <laughs> it's a live person who helps connect uninsured to primarily the public programs, but we're going to mobilize them for the exchange as well. And I keep thinking that there's not enough of that for the insured population and that the people that should be doing this are the folks at your employer-based insurance benefits office um, because we're talking about people rolling over at age 65 as they retire if they get to do yeah. that. And in fact, we just had this in my household where my husband had the choice to either stay with his city and county of San Francisco insurance or roll into Medicare and his benefits person couldn't advise, couldn't do anything. Yeah. And that's where we see a lot of success with people as this navigator application assister function because I wonder how much people really understand what they're reading. It's one thing to add up the dollars and say what's cheapest, but it's another thing to understand premiums and benefits and what these packages right. offer and whether they're right for you. So I would just say that that's probably an area for observation is the outreach and enrollment piece of the exchange and the Medicaid expansion option. I agree. I think that there's almost no guidance being given. You can't even see your retirement counselor until you're nearing retirement anyway. It makes it very difficult. Um, in, terms of the in terms of the exchanges, though, I mean, the navigator is, uh, there's so, someone is going to be paid to help you, the uninsured person, use the exchange, but they're not allowed to tell you what to buy. So it'd be interesting to be a fly on the wall and see how those interactions are going to happen. I mean, you have to have a job in order to retire. So you've got the, you know, the ordinary elderly person who you know, is getting to this point, and I guess you could try to do it through Social Security, but 
Yeah. But 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 back back to the exchanges, the young the, the younger uninsured people might not have had this experience. Uh, younger people on average are more likely to have ha had exposure to the computer, so I don't want to act as no, though I this is a older people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and I think that raises a question though, as time marches on, well, that I, I, this is a different segment, but um, we do some surveys of physicians through the medical board, and, and this has been over a five year period where they have the option to answer on paper and online, and they also, mm -hmm. have, at least over that period, have been able to do it for licensure. And we're now approaching about 90% doing it mm -hmm. online, and so I think some of them, I mean, it's, it's still a very, very important issue, but I, I think, the, you know, with the folks who are in, in retirement now, it's probably less of an issue than 10 years ago, and I guess I'm more interested in sort of the digital mm -hmm. divide, although even that, I think, is, you know, right. we're phasing out to some extent. Yeah, I think that that's right. But, so I think the bigger issue isn't actually being able to use a computer. It's being able to call up the quality information, then being able to distill that and figure out how you're going to weigh all these things together. Uh, yes. Um, I think you mentioned something about going into a little more detail about how you determine whether somebody had made a bad economic choice for them in the calculation. Um, because at one point, you know, putting $386 on the table at risk for some households, that's not a huge deal, but you must have some sort of calculation to determine when people have made a bad economic choice for them. Is it just as a percent of their their income, or how do I, if you ask most seniors, if you look at the average income of seniors, it's not, not all that high. Uh, is $400 important to them? You're gonna, you're gonna find out that it is, but we, although we, have asked them about income. We've never done what you said, to see whether people who are, it's more of their income if they're making better choices. It's a good idea. We, we haven't done that calculation for whatever reason. The answer? So the people who are pretty savvy about how they help people make good choices is consumer reports. And you know, one of the things they do is give you the information and then they give you the check. Yeah. And <laughs> so would there be a way, the problem is the best choice will depend on people's situations. But is there some way that you could classify prototypes of people, say, you know, if you care about this, at least just give them a check. And my guess is that that would also start to guide decision making. Yeah, I don't think the government could do that, but a company, a company like, but a broker like eHealth Insurance could be, could, could be doing that. Well, but, and you, but you could imagine like CMS asking you some, you know, in general, <coughs> are you more concerned about monthly premiums amount to copay. Yeah, but I'm not sure people would give the right answer to well, that's uh, the, you know, the one see the one reason to think that there could be some uh, life to an idea so, to, to, to yours is that CMS is getting more prescriptive than it used to be because now what it's doing if a plan does not get three stars in its quality, you can't renew it online you have to call up the company so there's an example where they are moving in that direction so maybe the answer to your question is it depends on the 2016 election um, <laughs> uh, Wendy did you have something I'm, I'm just thinking that you know the work that you did looking at part D plans for drugs there it seems like there's more certainty because people know what you know their chronic illness medications mm -hmm. are but when you talk about the exchanges figuring out what a plan is going to cost you you know particularly for the young people <coughs> maybe seniors have better yeah. ideas but thinking of young people well I'm not going to break my leg this you know they don't think about this kind of stuff yeah. so it seems like it's harder I don't know how you put in that uncertainty in the, in the decision making if, if you're talking about the cheapest plan you don't really know what it's going to be no, you really don't know what it's going to be it depends on what happens to you that's exactly right and that's why the stuff gets really hard because you shouldn't be looking only at expected value you should be looking at at uh, variance as well and so the making it's um my son, are you going to break your leg this year? Which plan should we choose for you? And, and he looked at me like, what? <laughs> Another issue that comes up is a plan with a couple of wheelchairs, a plan with a couple of, you know, this or that, some specific kinds of things. But some do and some don't. Yeah. And, you know, something could be important to Right. We, we actually seem to be encouraging adverse selection in that regard. You know, we, we think people should sign up for the things they're going to need. Yeah. Uh, yes. I'm 
when you were talking about winnowing down choices and about what sorry? Winnowing down choices and uh -huh. government can do it. Did you look at other countries, um, for examples? So I have worked in other countries, but I'm trying to figure out the context. The one difference in other countries is that with the exception of the Netherlands recently, the insurers are not are, are non-for-profit. And so they don't have the same incentives that our insurers do to try to, um, well, I think I'll just end that sentence right there. <laughs> uh, so, um, well, so, ger so in Germany, you can now choose from any sickness fund in the country, and there, there are several hundred of them. And uh, I, wish I, uh, I wish I had my colleague Yaniv here to answer, to answer that question, because uh, they, ha they have opened them up. And uh, I don't know much about uh, the results of opening them up. I'm sorry. I'm sure I've read something about that. <laughs> yes. I've been fascinated with the um, way that biology and brain and the brain sciences is increasingly informative about choice theory. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, uh, particularly with the, this thought that rational and irrational behavior has different locations in the brain. That you know, this whole sighting of where these things take place and. Do you see some potential there? Because it, it sounds like, for example, that impulse decisions are decisions mm. made in five seconds or less, but you do better, or you do worse, actually, if mm. you wait too long. Like, mm. that kind of way of how you present the information yeah. so that it's a, a well-based decision that is what the person really wants and needs. Yeah, I think, I, um, I, standing up here, it's hard for me to come up with the particular choice architecture that would do that, but I think you're right. I mean, that's what Kahneman's book really is about. It's about the, uh, the, the type one brain and the type two brain. The type one is the impulsive one that makes you uh, run when there's a fire. The type two is the one that, consider, that considers things. Type one usually does a good job, but in things like this doesn't do a good job. But then I'm reading the Steve Bo Jobs biography right now, and he's going tremendously on, uh, on the gut instinct, which Kahneman uh, really pretty much tears apart in terms of making those decisions. So uh, it's, uh, it's hard for me to disagree with you. I think that trying to get people to consider these things uh, more carefully is good, and that might be why we might want to do something like if you make this, this, this say this much money is at stake with this decision, you know, it, uh, the average person in your community is losing $400 because they're not choosing the cheapest plan. Try to make it more salient to them, but I, I don't know exactly how you would do that right now. Yes. I think this will be our last question. Uh, do you think the party advice should be um, a disclaimer on the CMS website or maybe on the exchange that says, please do not attempt to make a plan choice unless you're within 30 minutes of a meal? <laughs> 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 Have you had your chocolate yet? <laughs> 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 <laughs>